Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to today's information briefing. I hope that you are all safe and well. I am joined today once again by the Commissioner of Police, Ian McGrail. I will start today's briefing with today's statistics. As of this morning, the COVID-19 figures are as follows. The total number of swabs taken, 4,099. Results pending, 491. Results received, 3,608. Negative results so far, 3,346. Cases confirmed so far, 146. Recovered cases so far, 143. That leaves us with three confirmed positive cases today, none of whom are in hospital. The number of positive cases today is the same as it was yesterday. It is low. This is good, of course, and it shows how by working together and following the rules, we have been able to suppress the virus. Of the three positive cases at the moment, one arises from normal testing, that is, following a call to 111 when the person manifested symptoms, and the other two arise from the targeted and systematic swabbing of frontline workers. This means that those workers who tested positive after the systematic sampling had been asymptomatic. It is almost two weeks since we started the targeted sampling of frontline staff. During this time, 1,375 swabs have been taken. 925 have been processed, 450 are pending. From this exercise, there have been four confirmed cases. Of these, two remain active. Both are home and well. These statistics form part of the global statistics that I read at the start. They are not in addition to them. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the GHA's infection control team, Nathan Lightbody and Sandra Neto, and Kenneth Orfila, who have been working relentlessly since January, undertaking the majority of the COVID-19 swabs throughout Gibraltar. I thank them for their tireless dedication on the front line. This targeted testing of frontline staff is very much the key that will tell us how prevalent this virus is among us. It is possible that we may have the virus without symptoms. Not having symptoms means that we may not know that we have it, but it will not stop us from spreading it. It is for this reason that frontline staff always behave as if they do have the virus with the use of PPE and following the other public health guidelines so as to minimize the spread of infection as much as possible. You have seen that since we commenced the lockdown measures, there have been gradual relaxation to these measures. We will gradually release the lockdown measures in a phased way. As you know, this week the Chief Minister will lay out the plans to release Gibraltar from the lockdown and the roadmap on how we will unlock the rock. As the lockdown measures are eased, we must make every effort to prevent the virus from being transmitted from person to person. We must continue to follow social distancing rules and respect the lockdown measures in place as these are there to keep us all safe. The targeted testing of individuals and the contact tracing of positive cases will be key factors that will enable us to unlock the lockdown. You may have heard the Deputy Chief Minister announce yesterday that we have set up a new public health screening facility at the University of Gibraltar. This has been set up so that we can give effect to our new strategy of test, trace and isolate. We will test to confirm positive cases. We will identify and trace contacts of a confirmed case while they are infectious. We will isolate confirmed cases and their close contacts. In order to increase our testing capacity, as a civil contingencies measure, the Ministry of Public Health commissioned the setting up of a COVID-19 testing facility at the Gibraltar University to cater for screening for COVID-19. <clears throat> the test being used is a fast screening test 
that has been developed in the UK by Gibraltarian microbiologist Dr Nick Cortes and his team at Hampshire Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. The teams from the University of Gibraltar, Public Health, GHA and Civil Contingencies have been working at lightning speed over the last few days to set up this facility within days. We are aiming to increase testing over the coming weeks to 300 tests per day with results available within 24 hours. This large volume of testing, which is about 1% of the population per day, will allow us to track the rate of infection within the community and help us decide whether the lockdown measures can be further relaxed over the coming weeks. It will also serve as an early warning system if the virus transmission starts to increase in our community. This new lab that we have set up locally will enable us to test the community vigorously with a quick turnaround time for the results and this will work in partnership with a contact tracing bureau. The contact tracing bureau will consist of a team located on two sites. First at St Bernard's Hospital with the 111 team which will be expanded to provide contact tracing and also at the Europa Point Hospital, the Nightingale facility. The existing staff have been repurposed to perform the contact tracing role. The contact tracing bureau team will consist of over 40 people and training has already started this week and the contact tracing will commence next week. The contact tracing bureau team will be informed of all new cases of COVID-19. A clinical member of the team will contact the person who has tested positive and inform them of the positive result. They will then carry out a case interview. This interview will collect important information about their current symptoms and past medical history. Contacts during the infectious period will also be identified. The person will be advised to self-isolate. This is very important. It's very important that this advice is followed as it will ensure that the virus is not transmitted to anyone else. The contact tracing team will then track and call all those people who have come into close contact with the infected person. These contacts will usually be well and unaware of the contact until they receive this call. They will be informed that they have been in contact with someone with COVID-19 and asked to self-isolate for 10 days from the date of contact. This is because the contact may be incubating the virus in those 10 days, as if the contact then became infected with the virus, they may transmit it to others before they develop symptoms. By isolating all close contacts, we prevent onward transmission of the virus. Thankfully, most contacts will not develop the virus, but all will have to be quarantined. This is because there is no test available that can tell us if a contact is incubating the virus. It is not yet possible to tell which of the contacts will develop the virus until after they can infect others. The contact tracing team will monitor all contacts in case any develop symptoms of COVID-19 and they will be advised to call 111 so that a diagnostic test can be arranged. If they test positive, they will be asked to continue in self-isolation until they are no longer infectious. Because they have already been in quarantine, they will not have passed the virus on to anyone else. This is how we stop the onward transmission of the virus. Contact tracing will be the most effective if we can identify as many cases of the virus as possible in our community. Those who have symptoms are calling 111 and are being tested. But of course we know that the virus can be spread by people who don't even know that they have it because they have no symptoms or because the symptoms are mild. So in order to identify these asymptomatic cases, we have to significantly increase our testing capacity so that we can screen large numbers of people and obtain the results quickly. This will allow us to identify asymptomatic cases 
and isolate them and their contacts before the virus spreads any further. So this test, track and isolate strategy means that individually and collectively you will all play a critical role to help us unlock the rock. The lockdown measures that we've had in place on the advice of public health have been extraordinarily successful so far. The number of COVID-19 cases in Gibraltar has been kept low. Less than half a percent of the population and we have so far been able to protect the most vulnerable in our community. This success is down to you. It has come about as a result of your cooperation with social distancing measures as well as the lockdown rules. Thank you for following the rules and please continue to follow the advice as we move on to the next stage. Before I pass over to the Commissioner, I would like to say how vital policing is. The situation that we find ourselves in has meant that the Royal Gibraltar Police has had to quickly adapt from its routine policing and law enforcement to meet the needs of and to safeguard our community against COVID-19. Not only do they now patrol to ensure that the civil contingencies regulations are being observed, but this weekend has also demonstrated the breadth of their role in our community. Officers of the Royal Gibraltar Police, together with the Gibraltar Port Authority, Customs the Board and the Borders and Coast Guards Agency, worked together in the successful repatriation of 23 individuals who needed to be brought over from Morocco. This shows us how the Royal Gibraltar Police adapts to keep us all safe in many ways. On this repatriation mission, I would like to thank everybody who was involved in its success and to particularly single out the work undertaken by Ernest Danino from the Office of Civil Contingencies who led on the coordination of this and has been in communication with all the relevant entities and individuals since the lockdown in Morocco began. Thank you. I now hand over to the Commissioner of Police, Mr Ian McGrail. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Good afternoon, uh, viewers. In today's briefing on law enforcement activity, I will provide you with a quick rundown of what has been keeping us busy since my previous address of last week. I will also touch on very important crime prevention advice, which I hope will provide some thought-provoking self-reflection to ensure you and members of your family don't fall victim to crime. So with the restrictions gradually and consciously being lifted, we are what we are noticing is that people are becoming less risk averse and are increasingly leaving their households. Whilst most continue to abide by the rules and maintain suitable social distance, it is clear that some, especially younger members of the community, are not abiding by the condition to remain with members of their own household and are mingling with others. We are increasingly seeing young teenagers out and about without their parents. The taking of these liberties in such preemptive fashion will only hamper public health and government's plans to ease us all out of the lockdown measures in a way which ensures that the virus is kept under good control. This bank, week, uh, bank holiday weekend, with nicer weather, with the exception of today, has seen more people moving about, with most complying with the community safety measures. Most shops were closed on Friday, with those few that were opened fully complying with the regulations. On Saturday, town was quieter compared to last week, and those shopping were observed to maintain good so a social distance. Some shop owners, though, needed reminding of the important responsibilities that they and their staff had to abide by the rules. You see, it is actually possible. All that is required is that little bit of effort and self-responsibility. What we saw in town this past few days is indeed very encouraging from a community safety compliance standpoint. The beaches, though, became busy and were short closed shortly after 20 to 3 p.m. on Friday. Unfortunately, the easterly wind meant that the undercurrents 
at all beaches on the eastern side, most significantly at Catalan Bay. The Department of the Environment raised the red flags at all three beaches. Unfortunately, shortly after midday, a young, uh, two young children and a woman in her 50s, in separate instances, ran into difficulties while swimming and had to be helped out of the sea by other people on the beach. They did not suffer any injury. In a third incident, a young woman also got into difficulties at Catalan Bay later in the afternoon and had to be rescued by a member of the public and two RGP officers who went into the sea. She was attended to by ambulance technicians and luckily did not require being taken to hospital. I want to thank those members of the public who assisted in these incidents. I am aware that a Mrs. Julie Gonzalez went to the assistance of the two kids referred to and a Mr. Darren Montegrifo went to the rescue of the young lady at Catalan Bay. I haven't yet got the details of the other members of the public who also helped, but my thanks and appreciation also goes out to them. There were increased members of the uh, numbers of persons attending all beaches on Friday. And for our officers, controlling access became challenging. Officers were constantly monitoring the volume of people and trying to ensure that good social distancing was being respected. The moment this was deemed to be compromised, and a sign of this were, was persons queuing up to enter the beaches, we took the decision to close off the beaches on the eastern side and requested those in the queues to respectfully, uh, respectfully move on and exercise elsewhere, whilst those already on the beach were moved on. The sea state was dangerous and the risk of personally, uh, personal injury high. Officers also had to move people on from Westview Park and Emerson's Place after they opted for these places to sunbathe and picnic. Yesterday, Saturday, the beaches were not as busy compared to Friday. And even though we did apply control measures on access, these were not being applied continuously throughout the day as the numbers did not warrant it. I will now move on to the enforcement statistics for this week, which have been added on to the running total since the restrictions commenced. The overall total of interventions start, uh, stands at 1,110, of which 57 persons resulted in being arrested. 14 persons have been reported for process. 421 have been warned and advised. 533 have been requested home and 85 persons have been physically taken home. All the activity I have alluded to refers to the policing of COVID-19 emergency regulations. It is true to say that some of those persons arrested for COVID-related offences had also committed other crimes which attracted attention to themselves. We have also uh, dealt with those who have persistently breached the regulations and defiantly ignored previous warnings given to them, which has left officers with no alternative other than to arrest them. In some of these cases, officers have had to resort to the use of physical restraints and even deploy incapacitant spray to subdue the level of resistance, obstruction and aggression shown towards the officers. I have to reiterate my thanks to all personnel involved in the policing of the COVID regulations not an easy feat at all. But with more people out and about, officers have been dealing with a myriad of other non-COVID matters, which are more akin to the state of normality as we knew it before lockdown. I am talking about the investigation of serious crimes. These are complex and resource-intensive investigations being carried out by detectives of the Crime and Protective Services Division. From serious fraud, high-tech crime, bribery, drug trafficking and money laundering, to property crime and sexual offences. Vigilant uniform officers have also detected some good drug cases. Our Canaan patrols have been busy tracking down tobacco smugglers on the east side. Only this week a group of young persons were arrested for a string of burglaries that had occurred a couple of months ago. We have also dealt with the number uh, with persons who, due to the amount of alcohol that they have consumed and have become disorderly. So my appeal, my appeal to you is that if you drink at home, do so in moderation and don't let the drink 
make you behave in a way which you would not normally do. Avoid getting into any disputes within the household or within neighbors or with neighbors. If you enjoy playing music from your, from your household, do so, but be considerate with volume levels so as not to inconvenience others. Police work is not always about dealing with or resolving conflict, and uh, I want to avail myself of this opportunity to join the Minister and other many officials who have already expressed the thanks to the crews of the Police Motorboat Sir Adrian Jones and the Police Authority Launch Admiral Rook for the outstanding humanitarian effort in bringing back a group of British nationals who had found themselves somewhat stranded in Morocco with the lockdown measures of that country. The Straits of Gibraltar do not necessarily make an easy crossing. In fact, Friday's crossing was a tricky one, but our mariners stepped up to the plate. I also salute all those who work behind the scenes to make this happen. Job well done. I'm now going to move on to provide some very important crime prevention advice. This advice is actually relevant any time or any season, and not just during the period of lockdown that we are living. However, it is very pertinent that during these times, simply because criminal, it, it is more important during this time simply because criminals adapt their practices to whatever landscape presents best opportunities to them. I am referring to how well you protect yourself and your property with your online and offline behaviours. I will first, uh, firstly deal with protecting yourself online and offer you a few basic tips for you to consider. Last week I touched on how parents should remain alert to what the kids got up to when online. The current pandemic has caused many of us to spend more time on the internet, whether it's for online shopping or video conferencing. Cyber crooks are ready to pounce if you take their eye off the ball and don't safeguard yourself properly. Check your privacy settings are set to the levels you are content with. The less generous you are with putting out personal details online, the better. Look after your identity details in the same way as you protect your valuables at home. When doing online shopping, make sure you're to engage with reputable sites and never save passwords on your browser. Do not fall for the rogue sites offering unrealistic, unrealistic offers which end up ripping you off your money. Don't get fooled by emails, the senders of which you do not recognize, where offers or requests are made for non-existent products, fake charity appeals, or even tax refunds. There are many fake emails during the rounds exploiting coronavirus pandemic, whether in relation to testing kits, medicines, personal protective equipment, etc. Don't let yourself get scammed. Always use unique, strong and unique passwords for your email accounts. Keep your apps and virus protection up to date, as otherwise you'll be weaker and more susceptible to a hack or an attack. At a more personal level, do not fall for a extortion attempt, where criminals try to extort money from you on the back of threats that compromising photos or videos of yourself will be posted to family and friends. Be responsible in this regard and do not play into the tactics of the crooks pretending to be glamorous women and men who very quickly take a fancy to you. The high chances are there is a quite the opposite looking cyber criminal on the other side. Do not share compromising selfies or video clips with anyone. We are dealing with cases where there has been a betrayal of trust between people in a relationship of friendship with a deceiving party unlawfully sharing these compromising videos or photos to others. And this then goes viral, causing a lot of distress and harm to victims. You can read up more on this advice from our website at police.gi or our Facebook and Twitter sites. I sincerely recommend that you acquaint yourself with this advice. Do not be complacent. In terms of your personal property, I would ask you that you consider the following. Now that you are leaving your homes for short stints to exercise or go for a quick shop, you may not think it important to ensure your home is secured. As you are not going to be out for long, you may not see the need to close windows if you live on a ground floor or properly lock your front door. Make sure you do. And don't 
by no means don't hide your keys under a plank pot or at top of the door frame, which are so, such obvious places where the burglar would look. Don't let the opportunistic thief have a field day. Similarly, if you use your motorcycle or car, ensure you secure them before you exercise or go to the shops. And do not leave any valuables within. We have already recently arrested two persons for tampering with cars in the South District. So the criminals are out there waiting to pounce. Don't give them that pleasure. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner, we'll take questions from the press now. We'll start with Christina from the Chronicle, please. Hi. I'm just wondering what you've learnt so far from managing beach access and what you envisage this will look like in the weeks to come and beyond. I'll invite the Commissioner to answer that one first. It's a very challenging role. Uh, we are acutely aware that it is a, a, an entitlement that um, the population has always enjoined, and this is the first time, at least in my 35 years of law enforcement education, that I've come across this very stringent me uh, measure. So I'm very, very alive to, to the, the, the grief that it causes. I'm not the only one. Government is probably more alive than I am. Um, what we do want is people to exercise self-responsibility. We cannot uh, emphasize that enough, uh, self-policing. And, and not abuse the, the, the opportunities that are being granted, um, as otherwise we may have to implement uh, more um, stringent measures. We don't want to during the process of unlocking, but at the same time it's a very difficult act to balance, that of ensuring social distancing to prevent the virus from spreading and allowing people their, their entitlement of, of, of enjoying summer and the beautiful beaches. Being going to the beaches, caught up in the lockdown and we can't forget that where we find ourselves right now is in a lockdown situation. Working together with the Royal Gibraltar Police, we have established a threshold of control at the beaches where people are allowed to be on the beach for exercise for a period of 30 minutes. The point of that and the aim of that is to be able to give everybody the opportunity of going to the beach. The beach is important for us and at least this way with a controlled um, attendance, hopefully it means that everybody who wants to go to the beach will go to the beach, albeit for a restricted period of time. Now, as um, in the same way as the whole of the lockdown will be looked at going forward, uh, going to the beach will of course be looked at and as uh, weeks and months go by, we will look at the situation of the lockdown generally and always uh, guided by public health advice. Next question, yes. I just want uh, you to, can you clarify a little bit more, how will the contact tracing work? Is it via an app or automatically via a device? Is it voluntary or actually something which is compulsory? When it comes to contact tracing, the contact tracing bureau that I um, spoke about earlier is in relation to a team of individuals. We have set up a team of 40 people to contact, to try and get in contact with people that someone who's tested positive can identify that they've been in touch with. So this particular one means that they will be reaching out to people over the phone. As you know, um, we're also looking at various apps. There are apps that are being trialed in different places and we are looking at those as, as well. So we want to basically have all these tools at our disposal because going forward the important thing to do is to identify in case there's a likelihood that people are um, carrying the virus and reach out to them as soon as possible and test them as soon as possible. And you don't think there's a violation in people's privacy by reaching out to those people who have um, the disease in order to stop its spread? We've taken um, a lot of advice on data protection issues because of course everybody has a fundamental right to privacy but this is also needs to be taken as a, a measure of uh, public importance and of national importance and we need to balance both. Um, it's important for us to get that data. The data is necessary for us to be able to then, or for the public health professionals, to be able to advise us on which for, uh, policy we formulate going forward. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. 
We now move on to the questions sent uh, remotely from the press. The first one is for Minister Sacramento from YGTV. Some people have been in contact seek seeking clarification on whether a re recreational drive in a vehicle, commonly known as a spin, is allowed under the lockdown rules. If not allowed, what is the reason given that recreational trips in boats are permitted? I'll start the answer to that question with the preamble that we continue to be in lockdown. So everything that is uh, permitted under the exceptions to the regulations have to be taken and have to be read with the context that we are in lockdown. There are exceptions in, in the regulations and going on a vessel or going in a car are exceptions. They are in fact the same exception because they are the exact same regulation. So it applies to both in the same way. But the question for that is whether going out, whether it's in a boat or in a car or even for exercise or all the other exceptions, the question that people need to ask themselves is whether it's absolutely necessary to do so. In the context of being in lockdown, the reason that we're in lockdown is because we want to continue to contain the virus. What we cannot forget is that the more we move, the more that we move the virus. The more that we move around, say whether we're going in a boat or we're going in a car, means that there is an element of risk the minute you leave your front door. There is a risk of either um, you contaminating the virus yourself or you may well be the, an asymptomatic carrier of the virus and you may um, come into contact with people along the way and that's a way of spreading it. So as with all the exceptions really, it's a question of whether that is um, a necessary thing to do at all. And I don't know whether the Commissioner may want to add anything to that. No, I, I'm moving about, like uh, reiterating the, the, the Minister's point, um, moving about is, is um, the, 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 the way that the virus is going to be moved. If you stay at home, this is the virus will, will, will naturally not move. Um, so even if it's exempted from a policing standpoint, even if it's exempted in law, um, our advice and our, we will continue challenging people whether they're out in the car or not, but we will be finding out uh, whether people are using, even exploiting that exemption further by mixing people inside the car with uh, those from other households. Um, we are um, aware that that is happening and that's why we will continue our um, enforcement in that approach to diminish the possibility of the virus spreading in accordance with public health advice. The next question is from Panorama for Minister Sacramento. With government promoting a cleaner environment by closing access to roads, etc., what detailed concrete plans are in place to encourage the public to walk, cycle, etc., considering some of these controversial measures are due to take effect within weeks? Well, I think that we can see from the evidence around us that the public is um, already quite encouraged to walk or to cycle around Gibraltar. It's um, good to see that people are... Um, being particularly mindful of being fit during this lockdown period. It sounds a bit contradictory, um, but for those people who are availing themselves of the exception to the lockdown to be able to exercise, then uh, I really hope that they continue uh, once the, the measures are relaxed and indeed once this is over. In so far as concrete plans, as you know, we're all working um, towards unlocking the rock and concrete plans um, will be announced when they are finalised. But it's, I, I hope that people will continue to be as healthy as they have been since the commencement of the lockdown. Thank you. The next question is from GBC, also from Minister Sacramento. BA have got things wrong this afternoon in Heathrow and left some local passengers behind. Um, they are set to fly back tomorrow, but haven't, as yet, been placed in accommodation. GBC understands the government is assisting. Could the Civil Contingencies Minister clarify the nature of the problem and support being offered to those stranded in London? It appears that um, there was a risk of this afternoon's flight being diverted to Malaga because of crosswinds. Now, it seems that um, people at the check-in desk at Heathrow Airport were not aware of the long-standing relationship um, that we have and the arrangements that we have in place for people um, for Gibraltar um, and that we do not require Schengen visas 
to enter into Spain. So because of some misunderstanding, people were offloaded off the flight and arrangements have been made, as you've said, for them to return tomorrow. We are um, in touch with the people who haven't been able to um, be on this flight to see how, how we can assist. And um, the government is also, in particular, the Minister for Tourism, is in touch with BA to find out uh, why this misunderstanding happened and what took place to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Thank you. Next question from the Chronicle. I'm just wondering, the Chief Constable of Police in Scotland has expressed concern um, on the, as to the challenges on policing should England and Scotland take two divergent routes out of lockdown. I'm wondering if you share those concerns here between Gibraltar and Spain as we both take our paths out of lockdown? Um, good question. Um, different landscapes, Scotland and, and, and England, no doubt, and different jurisdictions, and, 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 and the same would happen here. Um, but in public health terms, we are part of the Iberian um, pandemic. Two different policing styles completely. Um, we are far more community engaging and community friendly, perhaps, here. and we haven't had the, the issues that um, my Spanish counterparts have had in Spain. So um, I, I, I would not get anywhere close to that model because we are traditionally uh, a British style uh, of policing model and therefore there's no synergies to be drawn there in that regard. Whether then legislation brings us closer uh, from, from one nation to the other, then look, we will work towards what the statute, statutory powers allows us to. Uh, but uh, I, I don't see ourselves synergizing very much with, with a Spanish style of policing. Um, uh, sorry. Um, Commissioner, um, we have a question from a reader, um, and the reader wants to know if it was possible for police officers to wear masks when treating with elderly people within the golden hour, especially as some of them are um, poor of hearing and therefore need to be approached quite close by a police officer in order to be communicated with. Is that, is that viable or do you think that's over the top? Absolutely viable. Um, the public health advice suggests that if social distancing cannot be uh, applied, that uh, they recommend officers to, to wear those masks. So absolutely viable. In fact, our officers are constantly reminded uh, themselves because we, we are also humans ourselves and we can naturally fall into potentially a complacent moment of lapse. Uh, so I can take that on and um, if your reader uh, is or your, your your reader is listening, I can reassure them that that is a perfectly viable um, solution to her, cons her his or her concerns. Next question, please. Thank you. I now move on to the second round of questions sent home from press remotely, um, and this next question is for the Commissioner of Police from the Panorama. With the RGP taking action against the public in relation to the coronavirus, are those involved not concerned about the critically disturbing wide-ranging reports by the UK Inspectorate of Constabulary, which calls, among other things, on the RGP to do more to protect the public and highlights the serious deficiencies on how the RGP deals with victims of crime, with the UK Inspectorate also expressing concern that many recommendations in an earlier report three years ago have not been actioned or dealt with effectively. Uh, let me start by sort of um, giving context to the, the reasons why the RGP is, in, is inspected. This is a totally voluntary initiative. Um, we are not bound by any statutory power that we have to submit ourselves to in uh, any form of inspection. Uh, and in saying that, it just shows uh, the type of transparent and open organization that uh, the police in Gibraltar is. Um, certainly, we have I've already alluded to it in my statement that accompanied the publication of the report that I am embracing the recommendations and areas for improvement in a very constructive way, and so is my, my fellow command team officers. Um, it's, it's a shame that the, the, obviously these type of reports um, tend to highlight where the shortfalls are um, and don't necessarily highlight where the successes are. Um, but look, this is we are where we are. Uh, I'm looking forward to cracking on and, and getting those uh, recommendations actioned. 
um, and th that has been explained in my statement to, to uh, all of the media. Um, but I say it's a shame that um, there are some comments there which provide a very overarching and, and objective uh, reasoning of what the police is in, in Gibraltar because the, the same inspection team that is critical of us also highlights that the RGB provides a good service to the people of Gibraltar and that the, the workforce is professional, enthusiastic, enthusiastic and um, committed. If I could add to that, of course the report is a matter for the Royal Gibraltar Police and the Police Authority. Um, the Commissioner um, did discuss it uh, with me, um, in fact it was raised with me by the Chair of the Police Authority for my information. And this is um, an opportunity for the police who asked for the report. Now this is an opportunity to be um, appraised and, and um, audited by someone who's external and someone who is objective. And we've heard the Commissioner say that they have embraced the report. Certainly as Minister for Justice I work with uh, the police in matters where it is appropriate that we do work together and in so far as um, issues of training and resources then the Commissioner knows that we can work together and he can count on my support. Thank you. The next question is from YGTV for Minister Sacramento. Can you give more details of who will be tested when testing increases to 300 a day? On the advice of the Director of Public Health, this um, targeted testing is aimed at people who work in the front line. We're looking at predominantly testing uh, people who work in, in the care sector, so the health and care professionals, but we're also looking at essential services who are very much also in the front line. Thank you. And sorry, I'm not sure, just to clarify, that last question came from YGTV. And now this last question is from GBC for the Commissioner of Police. Is the Commissioner satisfied that the use of incap incapacitant spray earlier this week was proportionate? The use of incapacitant spray falls in with our, our, with our toolkit to dealing with, with um, instances where the use of force has to be applied. Um, there's a use of force continuum and, and it scales up in, in, in a ladder form, um, starting with um, passive um, compliance or, or, or verbal, verbal instructions to get somebody to oblige, uh, and then that goes up the, the realms to um, physical hand restraints um, to, to control somebody if they are disorderly or violent, um, and then the next step up is that of, of the incapacitant spray. It actually falls below the striking with a baton because simply because it causes uh, less injury and it also safeguards the officer uh, um, because you don't have to come into proximity with an aggressor. So under the circumstances, I understand that the persons subjected to this um, application have already pleaded guilty in court. So um, uh, there is no question in my mind that the officers acted uh, proportionately and with the, the right tools at their disposal. Had they used further uh, um, tools further up the ladder, they could have personally come to harm or harmed the individual. So the spray only causes a very momentarily discomfort that allows for the control of that uh, person to be apprehended. Thank you. There are no more questions today. Thank you very much um, for your questions. Thank you very much for joining us for today's information briefing. Um, I will conclude by saying please remember to follow the rules, to follow public health advice, and please remember that we continue to be in lockdown. Yes, there are exceptions, but please only use those exceptions and rely on them if it's absolutely necessary to do so, because the more we move, the more we move the virus. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a good afternoon.